Hello, everyone. Welcome to the School Counseling in Nebraska podcast. My name is Jake Willems. I am joined again with Lonnie Watson. Lonnie, how's it going? Oh, it's going great, Jake. I'm here. It's Friday uh, when we're recording. We'll pump this out on a Sunday and life is good. Yes, we are excited. We are doing our second uh, book club, NSCA book club. We're going to talk about our book, Hope Rising, uh, chapters specifically 9 through 16. But Lonnie, I want to start off. I had the most embarrassing coaching moment ever last night. We have our first, my first grader has his first soccer game on Saturday and we had practice last night. And as we get to practice, my whole team is go. I'm the assistant coach, but I was walking over with the head coach and I see a friend and he and I are catching up and talking and I realize I have one of the only soccer balls. So I take this ball and I kick it as hard as I can and it flies across and I nail one of my players in the back with this soccer ball. Now, you know, I could never do this kick again ever. It was the perfect right in the right in the back. And the student comes up to me afterwards, they my player, he says, Coach, why'd you kick me with the ball? And I was just crying. I felt so I felt so bad. And this is a kid that's maybe not the greatest athlete you've ever seen in the entire world. But man, I mean I you could give me a million dollars, I would never be able to kick that accurately. Has that ever happened to you before? Well, I'm laughing because as I am sprinting through the door to try to get to work on time this morning, we had a windstorm last night. I was telling you before we started and part of our playset um, came down and I had to haul some stuff to the dump this morning. So I'm running late for work. And so of course I'm sprinting into daycare with the door open because it's yeah. windy and so I push the door open and I just hear a thunk. And I would just cutest little one-year-old i just bopped him right in the head this morning with of the course. door so um we're batting 100 you and i but that... yeah, yeah he said mom mom why'd you why'd you do that to me <laughs> why'd you do that why'd you bonk me in the head why'd you kick me in the, with a soccer ball <laughs> yeah, i felt terrible okay anyway anyway we're you know we had our mistakes in the last 12 hours but we're, we're on a roll right now we're doing we're doing what we need to so you know i you and i met we dropped an episode back at uh, the beginning of March, kind of the first eight chapters of the book, some takeaways. I know we really enjoyed it. We were hoping for a little bit more like in-depth details. And and I sh- certainly think that these next eight chapters really kind of go a little bit more into the nitty gritty of, of, uh, of kind of what um, hope looks like and how we can be advocates for hope with students and some kind of gut-wrenching stories really are included here. How about for our format? We, we haven't really discussed this too much. Let's each maybe talk about two take two takeaways. And then our good friend, Liz Bartels, who was on an earlier episode, gave us a question guide. And I have two of those questions. Let's just kind of kind of go back and forth and discuss a little bit. Does that sound all right, all Absolutely. right with you? All right, so Lonnie, you start us off. What was maybe one of your take, something you took away that you thought was pretty interesting? Okay, so as the theme with this book um, goes for me, the anecdotal stories are just incredibly compelling to me. And it's nothing, these stories are not stories that, um, I would say this chunk of chapters, uh, the first um, story, um, a couple of the stories really were a little bit new for me, but you can think of a student, you can think of your own life. You can, I mean, I even told you and on the podcast, there's a couple of the anecdotal, there's one in particular about early dementia and Alzheimer's and some things yeah. we're dealing with in my own family that I had to skip it because it was too triggering for me at the time. And it, I just started tearing up, yes. um, but there, there are two different stories in this one that just got me again with the anecdotal information. The first one. It, that I want to talk about a little bit is about the anecdotal story. They talked about um, people on, on that have gone through massive weight loss. So mm-hmm. in, in this anecdote, there's, or in the story that starts the chapter, they talk about, um, especially some of these women who lost a hundred, was it Jake? It was hundreds. I didn't write yes. it in my notes of how much pounds, but we're talking about like hundreds of pounds. Yes. Like these people were severely obese, went from like, 400 pounds, 300 pound women to, you know, 180, 160, very healthy um, women for their size. And once they left the weight loss camp that they were doing or the program or the show, I can't remember if I think it might've even been a show. um, Some of these women had not only regained the weight, but gotten even worse in their health indicators after being so hopeful and so healthy. And they were studying this hope and health and what they found with a resounding rate, it was like over 90% of these women had been um, sexually assaulted 
in their past. And uh, I think not just sexual assault, but had uh, molestation as a child that led to their obesity. And so they were using food and their weight as a, you know, I'm doing the Heisman right here on the video yeah. and we need a video podcast at some point, Jake, but they were using their body and their weight as a, I don't know, protective factor. Yes. Right? Is that what you took from that story too? Absolutely. And, and there's so many examples, even of my current building of some of our kids that maybe are the ones that are, um, maybe have a little bit of an odor to them or wear the same clothes over and over again. I think specifically of a student I worked with previously that was um, trans and there was an element kind of finally at the tail end of my relationship working with this student that came out there was a lot of sexual abuse with someone that was still living in the household with them. And you can kind of understand maybe at a certain point where the dynamics of, you know, of human sexuality, we, we know are more than we're going to get into it in this podcast, but you can maybe understand where something like that maybe comes from a little bit when there is uh, your female body and there's a male body that's, that's doing things to you, you know? So I, yeah, I can relate. Absolutely. I know I my own family has, you know, and I've kind of had some of those same same resources of, of tr trauma and food as a coping mechanism or a way of kind of, you know, even weight kind of keeping stuff away. So, yeah, I mean, it's powerful and it's hard, hard to process, you know, hard to process. Absolutely. Well, and I'm kind of glad you went there with um, human sexuality a little bit too. I, I wasn't going to be brave enough to go there, but I had a conversation with my school nurse and I love my school nurse not long ago where she had some very pointed and opinionated things to say about students with gender who are dealing with gender identity yes. um, concerns, issues, questions. And she had very strong beliefs of what she said. And my response to her was in all my years of doing this, a lot of the times when students have, um, you know, not, not just that they have questions or they're curious or any of that, but that they have very strong willed beliefs and, um, concerns or that the teachers don't quite understand is because we've had some sexual assault in the past. And I just wanted to like find some empathy with her and her beliefs on, but what if you don't, what if you just don't understand or if you can't, right? Yeah. It, what if you can't understand that one, because um, you've never felt that way in your body or two, because your body has been violated in a way that maybe somebody else doesn't understand. And I, I felt like this huge sense of compassion for these women in this story that had lost all that weight and were so, um, cause it was like, it was a part of the story where they were hopeful for their new lives, but they hadn't regained their power yet in the right way. Cause it wasn't just about, it wasn't just about the weight. It wasn't just yeah. about the food. It was about, um, feeling protected and safe in their own bodies. And so I don't know, those kind of stories are, um, I don't know. I just think they're really good. It's like when you and I share like some of the fiction books we're reading yes, and how I was thinking even, of that specifically. Yep, yes. Even if we're, we're not, it, even if it's nonfiction of like how we can be transplanted into somebody else's life and use empathy for a point of like, maybe we will never understand, but how do we help these humans um, move towards a hopeful future and cope and regain their power? I feel the same way. I mean, there is a component of you don't want to make a jump into saying that it's because of sexual trauma that this right. happens. I mean, they're, they're, I don't think that's supported by any kind of, of science or, or stuff, but you are right. When I think of some of the students that have needed the most amount of hope and the most amount of things, there is a, an element of that trauma that can kind of lead to that. And it's hard. I mean, when you think about what this book talks about, of we need pathways, you know, hope is not just having hope, but also having pathways to get there. You can maybe understand sometimes why students and, or kids maybe don't that are trying to express a certain, you know, concept of themselves in maybe a particular particular home or a particular community they don't feel those pathways man how important for them for there to be adults like like school counselors or um like loving teachers that are that are really looking out for them to play a role so i love it that's that's fantastic uh, I'll, I'll kind of start off my first thing that i took away and i think we briefly maybe mentioned this before 
But for anyone that just is it, it is not aware, I thought that that introduction on what ACEs are was just kind of just such a key fundamental thing that just everybody needs to know about. So for some of our friends that are maybe brand new school counselors or they're halfway through their program and, and got a job already and are, are kind of just in the weeds of it, ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And um, there's all there's about 10 different aces the book talks about there's neglect there are different types of neglect different types of abuse if there you've been in you know have a divorced family if there's mental health issues if there's drugs and alcohol in your home and statistically the more aces that you have it can kind of lead into higher risks of a student dropping out of school struggling with substance abuse struggling with all these sorts of things and, and i know that you know, in my graduate class I'm doing with Doan, our students, we talked about it that briefly. And many times people maybe could have four, five, six ACEs. I think the book even talks about how one of the authors had an A score of eight, meaning eight of those 10 things had been a part of their upbringing at some time. It's not a, it's not like a, a preordained, you know, history of this is journey of this is where you're going to end up at. I just thought that was so helpful. And I really love that, that briefly that kind of talked about the assessment scores that you can do to kind of get information from kids. At my district, we're in the middle right now of, of coming up with a good screening tool. I know I think you did a post a, 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 a um, podcast episode about this a while ago. And who knows what we'll be able to do. But when I was in Omaha, we did what was called the RAPS assessment. Did me and my OPS friends ever talk to you about that, Lonnie? No. The Very RAPS assessment, at my school, we had like a very, we had a, a, a doctor's office, essentially. And people that were consented could take this RAPS assessment. And it was very specific. I mean, it was, I have access to fruits and vegetables. I think there was a question on like, sexual contact you know i i've had it been in an intimate relationship all of these sorts of things and then there were some specific like suicide screenings and man were those it was like pretty rough sledding and i understand that in a lot of nebraska maybe something that specific that you're not it's just not going to fly but it certainly did help us kind of have reach really targeted resources you know sometimes for um students especially those that were suicidal or those sorts of things so aces are such an important thing, adverse childhood experiences. Those of you that are listening, probably a good portion know what those are already. I thought chapter nine does a, a really fantastic job talking about that. Do you guys work? I know you're a trauma informed school district. Do you guys deal with ACEs in like a specific sense out there? We, we do not screen for ACEs, but we our universal screener that we've used for the last uh, five years is the BIMIS universal yep. screener, which, um, I mean, loosely screens for some ACEs, right? It, it screens for suicidal ideation, um, self-harm, active self-harm, and then just negative affect. It, and so um, obviously if I was a medical professional, I could call that a depression or anxiety screener. Yeah. And since I'm not, I call it a maybe sadness. Yeah. So, you know, we were kind of screening for indications that we have some sadness. So, um, so yes and no. I don't know if that answers your question, Jake, of, of I feel like all those screeners, whether we make them our own or we use ones, we're kind of trying to screen for some of those. Yeah, and part of part of it is like district wise, it's very different. When you're in a rural community, you see the news register, or, you know, your newspaper, and you see when someone a parent's been arrested for for you know drug usage or those sorts of things. In a big district, I mean, I I would know zero zip about any of my families outside of there. So right, you know, I think it can be hard sometimes to do that. But I, I love that chapter. I, I'm just a big fan, not of ACEs, I think ACEs are horrible, but of knowledge about that and thought processes of how to, how to kind of reach out to people. So that was my, that was probably my number one. What, what about your, your number two? What would you say? So my number two might be my number one. I went back and forth because this was the first thing I texted you when I yes. read chapter 10, chapter 10 is strangling. Is, yes. um, and so I feel like mine aren't very happy things to talk about, but I think they're really important. I, I will never forget that, um, this story. And so basically in chapter 10, chapter 10 is called Sometimes It's Too Late for Hope. Yeah. Um, and chapter 10 really says, and it, it follows up the really good chapter on ACEs about how domestic violence and childhood trauma form the why of America's mass murder problem. And so they talk a little bit about mass murders in the form of shooters. They talk in um, of mass shootings. They talk a little bit about murders or mass murders in very specifically of people who murder cops 
or police officers. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of research that I did not know existed um, that once, um, basically they're talking about domestic violence at this point. And they say once a woman, and this is where the word strangling comes into, they started with choking, but they said, no, choking is, is one thing. Strangling is very much with more intent, right? With intent to physically harm. Um, so they say once a woman is strangled, she is 750% more likely to later be killed by that man. Man, 750% more likely. They did a study, and I didn't ear tag this one um, to give you the exact um, data points. And Jake, you've got one of those photogra photographic memories, so you might remember. They talked about um, people who kill police officers or have a domestic violence in their history. And I cannot yes. remember the statistic, but it was like resounding. And they say it's underreported too, because domestic violence is underreported and it's not always classified where it needs to, but that offenders, domestic violence offenders are like a bunch times more likely to be ones that um, kill co cops or have um, are involved in, in mass murdering, mass shooting. Yeah, and I, I have think, the stat. I have the stat here. Oh, it do. says the 2017 data is very re revealing. Nearly 80% of all killers of law enforcement officers in this country have a domestic violence history and 20% have a strangulation assault history. And that's crazy. And they say the strangulation is wildly underreported because we don't always classify it. We don't take that and classify yes. it as its own. And I think they're saying we need to. Yes. We should do that. Um, and so I think what they're trying to say in sometimes it's too late for hope is not that it's too late for those people to impart hope, but we need interventions right then, right there. We need yeah. to quit minimizing domestic violence and we need an intervention right then and there. We need to um, quit, uh, like, like I said, quit ignoring very specific types of domestic violence and as a country, as a community, maybe as, um, you know, just people, leaders in our community of um, trying to find ways where we can get the people the help they need, both the victims um, and the perpetrators. Yeah, I, you know, when I read that, I, I'm involved in the youth center here in our community. I know you and I have talked about that briefly. Um, and there are a group of students that we're very welcoming. I mean, we see probably between 100 to 120 kids in a weekend grades sixth through 12th grade that come in and uh, there's a handful of and I'm like always like even if kids are jacking around we need to give them chances but we have a handful of students that um, choke each other and they do chokeholds but when I read this chapter man that like was pretty stark to me to kind of think about that now there's a difference between a chokehold and I'm not gonna use my hands and strangling somebody, especially the intimacy almost of, of being right there. But that was a really um, shocking thing. And it made me think of my time back in Omaha of students that I would have high school students, freshmen sometimes that would be in those um, domestic violence and have, have, you know, bruises around their necks. And um, there is, I think an element of with kids, students of, um, downplaying it like kids are learning how to be in a relationship they don't quite understand you and i know this as high school counselors especially barriers of the texting wanting each other's passwords and checking their passwords all the time and doing those sorts of things so um yeah it was just totally totally fascinating and some of the kids that i worked with that were that did demonstrate domestic violence you know all, almost all of mine that i worked with were boys um it's kind of a hard, I know I have a hard time. I'm a pretty empathetic person, but I have a hard time sometimes having patience with those students, you know, or, or wanting to support, you know, I, I know for myself, I can feel like they need to be punished, but I think the idea like that chapter is called, you know, when people don't have hope is almost exacerbating it and going to make it such a worse situation later. Am I, do you think I'm on the right track there? I do. And I think we both truly believe, and I just want to say this hurt people hurt people yes. right and so i empathize with these teenagers or young adults or whoever we're working with that are you can see the cycle of the manipulative relationship even yes. if it's not violent um coming and i just after reading that chapter i'm actually like i'm super excited 
Jake, because I needed that. It's one of those times when you read a book, you're like, I needed to read that. I needed to read that to stop minimizing things that I know are leading down the wrong path, right? Whether they ever get violent or not, just we're isolating our um, boyfriend or girlfriend from their friends. We're we're doing things that just start that little cycle of manipulative yeah. relationship. And it made me really excited about getting into a, a couple of our classrooms a little bit more and sharing that data so that the, the people in that room and the kids in that room, they hear me say that and they hear me say how passionate I am to work with kids on relationships. Like that's part of my favorite. It's prom season here, Jake. So we've yeah. got a lot of prom season has been rough on me. I'm just going to tell you that yeah. a lot of breakups happening right now, but be able, but being able to sit down with a kid and through their tears, empower them that they're making the right choice or, or, you know, however it is, if there are red flags, helping them process, maybe if they got yeah. out of a bad relationship, but Absolutely. there's still that hurt. Yes. Right. Or if they were just tired of getting treated a certain way or, uh, both the boys and the girls, like it's not, it's gender neutral in this, what yeah. I've been dealing with, but, um, just to be able to empower them of like what they deserve in a relationship and what they should kind of see as red flags, whether that person is a great person or not, it just could be a red flag for them together. So I don't know. I think reading that chapter, even though like it's going to sound a little down those two stories, it's like it empowered me to not minimize. I'm going to get in tier one a little bit more with relationships and I'm going to share those stats and I'm not doing it to scare kids. I'm doing it so that when they see red flags early, they know that they they have hope and they have worth and they have value. It, it, it's kind of hard. I mean, there's an element of, I know sometimes administratively or, or even with teachers, there's an element of why are we talking about relationships? Why are we doing these sorts of things? Kids are here to learn English and math and reading and science and all those sorts of things. So I, I you're a hundred percent right. When students are in duress or even as freshmen see sometimes the seniors, uh, once again, sorry, we're talking about a high school, we're in a high school building, but it, when freshmen see seniors that are in some of these sorts of relationships and they're on the same football team, it's just building a, you know, this is what it looks like. This is okay. This is how it should be. So you're just right. I mean, you're right on the money. I love it. Well, yeah, I mean, and- if you're elementary, it's friendships too. You know, my friend told me to wear this certain clothes one day and then made fun of me the whole day of like, yeah. well, do you, what do you deserve? Is that, a, is that something you should stand up for? You know, it's, I think when the, the littles, if you're an elementary school counselor, I think you talk about this also, but you're empowering these kids in their friendships mm-hmm. then to make better choices with romantically when they get older. Absolutely. Great chapter. I, I, that was the first, you know, the first chapter I read a couple weeks back and it was the same thing. I was like, whoa, that was a a stark thing. Okay. I'm going to take us a little bit of a different way. I liked um, on page 126, I don't even know what chapter that is, but in page 126, it talked about some of the signs of like bodily stress of of there not being hope. And it talked specifically about toxic stress and hypervigilance. Those were the two, the two big things that, that I, I just um, resonated with me specifically in the graduate class I'm doing with Doan, we talked about um, stress and then we talked about eustress. Have you ever heard of that before? No. Eustress is E-U stress, eustress. That's how I pronounce it. Someone smarter than me can correct me. But eustress, it talks about how that's like positive stress. The idea of like that the, the 15 minutes before a test, you want to make sure that you're ready or, and that you're prepared. Or if you're getting ready to do the long jump at a track meet, that, that like kind of the, the stress of your body kind of getting yourself ready to be able to do it and how that can be a positive thing. But how often are our kids that are the most lacking in hope, they have this toxic stress of going from experience to experience to experience, always behind, always struggling, not knowing what to do. I think being able to recognize that is just so important in helping students find their ways and empowering them once again to kind of um, take ownership of of what they need to do. How do you calm yourself down with some of these skills of of hope and plan yourself? And then right along with that, I think it was either right before or right after the paragraph about toxic stress, they talk about hypervigilance. And I was just at our church on Wednesday. I have a buddy that is a, that's a EMT, like a firefighter EMT in Grand Island. And he talks about some of the hypervigilance, like he, his wife will make comments to him about um, how he'll go into a place and he'll know where the exits are. Yep. And he will, he will do this and do this. And it just is always kind of cognizant. And his wife will be like, how did you wreck it? How did you notice that? You know, I, we were just in this place. And um, that's like kind of funny. And he's a, he's a well-adjusted, he's a good, he's a good, 
he's a good dude, good friend. But I know many of our students, I have, we had a student transfer to us from a bigger district um, a while back, and they came in with that hypervigilance. If they saw kids talking in a classroom, there was the assumption they're talking about me. Yep. When the student was walking down the hallway and a kid would look at them, I mean, normal, you know, normal thing that happens, it's, it's the idea of they're going to fight me right now. Um, so I, I, you know, once again, those are, sorry, listeners, this is not the most uplifting episode so far, but I thought that those were, um, that was such interesting, uh, interesting things and good stuff to keep in mind when you recognize those students, I think in your building that are expressing toxic stress, everything is a crisis. There's no ability to kind of normalize, or this is normal. This is really bad. And having those kids that are hypervigilant, man zero in on those students because those are the ones that are going to need the support and the practice of of building hope and and, um and figuring out how to have have some success does does that resonate with you absolutely and in the earlier chapters i remember writing down that if that um amygdala is in constant overdrive you cannot choose hope so you have to work on bringing the amygdala into, I call it shark brain. That's what I call it. I read a parenting book once and they called it shark brain. So I was yeah. working on getting out of the constant overdrive of the amygdala before we can choose hope. And that's hard work and it takes a long time. And it's not something you're going to do in one solution focused brief counseling session with no. a kid. It's like, yeah. that's when you've built a really trusting relationship over time and you've helped them yes. seek out trusting relationships. So um, that's, that's not going to happen overnight. And, but it's so important that we remember it. Cause like, Kids are not choosing that. They're not trying no. not to choose hope. There's yep. something bar- like there's a barrier in the way, and it's probably the um, amygdala and the that toxic stress. Well, hey kiddos, those of you that are going on the year school, if you have your money, please. That's all right. We'll let we'll let the- listeners be able to check out what's going on in your school right now. So let's say so we went through our um, our two po- points now on this uh, hope rising book study questions. They don't necessarily cover all of the chapters, but I thought they were just insightful. And I, I had two I wanted to ask you. So I'll, I'll shoot it to you and then then you should let me know how you feel. So one of the questions that they used from the first couple chapters of the book said, how would your daily experience change if hope scores increased in the people of your life? I'll leave it to you. You could either think of, of maybe family or the people. Probably for most of our listeners, maybe we'd be thinking in our school setting, either administrators or students. But but what, what would you say to say to that line how would your daily experience change if the hope scores increased in the people in your life more people would get what they want jake that's i mean like my gut just says like we would all have what we want (laughs) and not everything we want but more we would all have they would i would we would all have more of what we want i think when we feel good good things happen when we put out to the world what we're hopeful for and what we want the world tries to make it happen i really believe that um to my core. And so I think if we can all get into a more hopeful um, state of being, I, I really just think more good things are going to happen. I think when, when tides rise, when the tide rise, all ships rise, I say that all the time. Um, I truly, I think I can think of like, that's like at the macro, right? At the micro would be like less gossiping, um, less me trying to redirect conversations, more time to actually get the work done. Those, those kind of things at the micro, but at the macro, I just like truly believe more people would have what they want because they'd speak their truth to the world. And I really think the world is, I think almost all humans are good inside and more people would like work to make that happen for the rest of us. More opportunities for seniors, more opportunities for kids, more people help in schools. You know, I think you're right on the money. I I would, the word that comes to my mind is empowered. I think more students would feel empowered, just like you said, to articulate who they are, to articulate what they, what they need, to articulate what they want. I think so often, I, I mean, that's what we're trying to do with students is we're trying to give them those skills to be successful adults. And a lot of kids if they don't have a lot of hope, they don't feel empowered to do to do the things or reach out for these goals that maybe seem kind of unobtainable for them. So, yeah, I totally agree. I think um, I think the more we increase hope, man, think about a, a school building. If every kid had hope and what felt felt positive and felt empowered and felt like teachers cared about them, man, I mean, it would be lights out. You would be winning state championships for everything. I mean, it'd be amazing. So I'm going to rapid fire the next one at you, Jake. I know you are going to give to me, but I want you to answer this next one first. Okay. And we'll send out, we'll put all of these 
um, Project Harmony discussion questions in our show notes too. In the, um, we'll try to fit them in the description and maybe pump them out on the Nebraska listserv as well. Uh, but this one's from chapters five through 10 and it says, what, Jake, what can you do to prevent people from reaching the point that it's too late for hope? You know, I think that in that way, it's just making sure that everyone uh, feels seen. When I was a classroom teacher, I remember I worked darn hard at learning my kids' name by the end of the first week because I want every kid to know, hey, this teacher actually knows who I am. I'm not just a number in their classroom. So I think uh, just getting to know and building those relationships uh, with people so that way they're actually kind of actively actively a part of their life would be um, so important. I also think it's just like a team. I mean, you think about in your district, in my district, it's a matter of if a kid's experienced um, lack of hope from age zero, basically to 14, and then they come into my building as a senior, or even think of a kid transferring in, it feels kind of almost insurmountable. What am I gonna do for this kid? You know, how am I going to be able to undo those sorts of things? So I think it's just a matter of maybe, you know, this is a big, this is a big picture, but it is just being that hopeful person in your community and, and really reaching out and doing what you can to, to, to really, to really love on people. So, and that's a hard thing to do. I mean, that's not, people are, especially now after COVID, I think we're much more isolated. We do our own thing. We're at our own house. I think that can be kind of a common thing. So that's what, that's what I just wrote down uh, when I asked you that. What, before I answered um, my number one thing there, and it seems like a selfish answer, but I don't think it is. Uh, we know hope is contagious. We know hope is like, what, three layers deep? Is that what yes. Liz told us? Like three people deep. So if yep. we help one person, they're going to help another person. So I think the number one thing that I can do to prevent people from reaching the point that's too late for hope is I can make sure my hope's high. I need to take care of myself and make sure my hope is high so that I can keep impacting three people deep. And I, I've always been a hopeful person, but I have stories. And so then I think the second thing that I need to do, and it kind of comes back to, and I didn't even think about how I need to get in those classrooms more in tier one and talk about more relationship stuff and use this data, is I need to speak truth. I need to not let fear drive me in this role and I need to get in and make sure I'm being appropriate in schools, but make sure in the tier one strategies that I am, uh, just just doing doing the hope work right getting in there doing the work not always waiting for kids to come to me because something i might say that i truly feel in my body and my bones all the things um might resonate with a student and so i i need to make sure that i'm getting in front of them tier one strategies and speaking hopeful and giving data so that if there's something that is triggering to them that we need to work on we've got time now so it's not too late when they leave um, the high school or a college setting, or they're in their own, they're a parent and they're um, perpetuating the cycle of abuse because they didn't get a chance to get out of it themselves. Yeah. I, you know, I, that's a great kind of way of, of almost even bringing it back. Kind of, kind of the last thing that I wanted to, wanted to share a little bit in on chapter 16 or last chapter, it talked about uh, nurturing hope and it gave like four stages, a stage of goal setting, a stage of, of focusing on the pathway, a stage of future memories, and then about how hope begets hope. You know, as you have a good experience, it allows other things to happen. But really what I loved so much was on page 162, it talked about like having an adult role model that can model hope for you. And, you know, you and I have talked a, a little bit in a variety of episodes on, on kind of our, our past and our, our childhoods and kind of what that experience was. And I know that I would not be where I am now if it wasn't for two families that built into me as a middle schooler, the Greg and Jody Madsen and Brian and Nikki Harms. They, um, they, I just was kind of desperate for support and help and, and could have very easily gone a, a much different way than kind of where I came from. They, these people are not educators. They were not in the school. You know, they were just people that, that kind of reached out to me. And I spent every day at their houses after school, one, either both of them or, or one of them at a certain amount of time. And so I think about that in my own community. I hope that as I, you know, 
I know you're well established in the community you are. I'm relatively new to where I am. But I hope to build that that place that students feel and, and friends and neighbors and kids feel like, uh, you know, our house is a safe place. This is a place you can you can kind of talk about. And man, I want my office to be to be the same way. And I know that you have that same ethos in the way that you kind of carry yourself. Right. Nailed it. I, I have zero to add to that, Jake. That is um, exactly how I feel. And as you're speaking about your people, I'm thinking about mine, too. Yeah, I think, you know, I think as we, you know, the more that at an individual level, hopefully the people reading this and following along with us are able to kind of make those own connections. Who are those people that build into your life and provided you hope maybe when, when times were rough? And man, the hope is just like you're saying, it just builds level after level kind of down, down the line from there. So. All right. With that, listeners, thanks for uh, popping on with us with our um, second episode of our book club. As you probably remember from our Instagram, we will have one more episode dropping uh, the first week of May, where we will finish out the last, I think, six chapters of six or seven chapters. And then we'll, we'll be having our live Zoom podcast recording, our, our little happy hour, bring whatever drink you want. If it's water, if it's Dr. Pepper, do what you want. But we would love to join you on there, kind of just to have a, a, a big discussion with everybody else as we've been following along. But if you have any questions, please make sure that you follow us on our podcast at NSCA pod. We love our pod squad. Make sure that you're following along with us and we will uh, finish up this book, our last couple chapters here that first week of May. Lonnie, have a great rest of your day. Hey, thanks everyone for joining.